All right, good morning. Come on. Clap and pretend you're awake. Let's go. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Compass. Great to have you here with us this morning. If you are a first time guest, thank you for showing up today. Um, July is officially over this week, and, uh, and I've seen uh, lots of stuff on the news about the Cowboys training camp, so that's all coming up. So summer's coming to an end uh, sooner than we think. Um, it's still going to be hot for like three more months, but uh, <laughs> at least that is coming. If you are um, new with us, we're really glad you're here. So, so we're in the middle of this really important series. Uh, we're in week number four now that we're calling This Changes Everything. And think about this. There are certain decisions that you and I make in our lives that have major impact on our lives, right? So, so for instance, if a guy gets down on his knee and pulls a little box out of his pocket with a little round thing in it, looks up at the girl of his dreams and says, will you marry me, right? And she responds with those magical words, yes, I will. Okay, that is awesome. And, and your entire life is about to change. We'll, we'll assume for, for good and for the better, <laughs> but regardless, your life is definitely going to change. If, if you decide to go out of state for college, if you relocate your family because of your job or, or you take a new job and move across the country, move out of the country, uh, you decide to have kids, all those happen. Um, some things in your life are going to change. Well, well, in this series, we've acknowledged that there may likely be some things going on in the world today that, that we don't always like, right? That we would like to see changed. Um, and we said instead of pointing the finger and instead of blaming others, uh, waiting for other people to fix it, we said certain change starts with us, right? I want to start with me. We want to start with us and, and work on the things personally that we can do, uh, focus on, that will make us agents of change, maybe just in our families, in our community, maybe even in the greater culture. And we've used language like, do for one what you would like to do for the many. So you'd like to see this mass change. All right, we'll do that for someone. Focus on, on what we can control now, right? Because we can't control everything. Um, not what you can, but what you can and build from there. And so today, where we're going, here's our theme, our response, right? This is the topic, our response changes everything. And so I kind of had one direction. I was planning on going with this and, and then I thought I would go with this and then God put something else on my heart. So I'm gonna take you where God told me to go. So if you don't like it, you blame it on God because um, he <laughs> made me go this way. <laughs> Speaking of response, right? Okay, so, so my son, who's, who's now 10, Zeke, I, I remember this four or five years ago probably, so he was probably, probably around the age of five. He was playing Xbox one night, and uh, he was really into Xbox in, in that season, uh, but it was, it was getting late at night, so, so I came into where he was playing his Xbox, and I said, hey, buddy, uh, you need to turn off the Xbox, go brush your teeth, get your PJs on, and, and go to bed. And he, he looks right at me, and without even skipping a beat, here was his response. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> that was the wrong response. Um, <laughs> Because listen, I, I had not gotten that memo, right, that, that I was no longer the boss of him um, because I hadn't sent that memo, um, so, so I didn't know that. And so I thought, okay, this is, it's like time for the DTR talk, right? Like, like I need to define how this relationship works, how things go in our family. So, so I looked at him and said, hey, so let me explain how our universe works, right? Here, here's kind of the org chart, if you will, or the hierarchy for our family. There's, um, there's God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's me, um, and then there's you, okay? That's how it goes. <laughs> God, me, you. So, so that's, that's how our universe functions, okay? Um, and so as long as I'm, you know, as long as you're living in, in my house, eating the food, sleeping in the bed, wearing the clothes that I paid for, right? As long as I'm paying the bills and taking care of you, I am the boss of you, right? And, and listen, again, he's four or five. He, he looks, again, right at me without skipping a beat. And again, his response is, nope, no, you are not. Mom is the boss of me. <laughs> and she's the boss of you too, <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay. So I stepped right in front of him, right? Like I got in front of him and the TV and I said, listen, Mom said, you need to turn off the Xbox. 
brush your teeth and go to bed. Because <laughs> listen, I know the right response, right? Um, I'm not going to argue that. I- I've done this long enough. <laughs> uh, and so, listen, okay, so, but listen, seriously, right response. What does, that, what does that look like and how does that change things? And so Paul is going to give us some really great words of insight in 2 Timothy chapter 2, right? That's where we're going to start uh, to help us respond and, and live our lives out together with God and alongside other people that are Christian and that are not Christian. And so he's going to write to this guy named Timothy about how to respond to controversial topics or issues that come up in the culture and in the church, which that's what God put on my heart. That's what I want us to deal with. So Paul's going to, let's go take a look at his words in 2 Timothy. How He's going to give us some help on, again, how to respond to controversial or polarizing issues that you and I deal with. So here's where we'll start, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, right? There's a lot of twos there, but that's where we're going to kick it off. Here's what Paul writes in his letter. He says this, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out, out of a pure heart. So, so which, okay, that doesn't mean that all young people are evil, although some of them are, right? Because like, there are certain sins or behaviors that are more prevalent among people when they are young, no? Like, like not a lot of 40, 50-year-old guys trying to single-handedly down a keg and see how far they can streak down Main Street without getting arrested, right? Um, that tends to be more of a frat guy stunt, okay? So, but, but the point is here is um, he's referring to people that are acting immature or childish. And you don't have to be young to act immature and foolish. You can be old too, right? Sin and folly do not discriminate. They are totally equal opportunity, young and old, male and female, rich and poor. So, so what we're talking about here is responding, right? Responding in a way that would be immature. So, so meaning this, something controversial. Some issue comes up and then you just have a knee-jerk reaction, right? You just jump on the bandwagon, fly the flag, quote the bumper sticker, whatever, and, and you become very reactionary. And Paul is saying, don't, don't you know, um, act f- or don't make excuses because you're young and, and um, don't be immature. Don't act like immature kids regardless of your age. Because how, how will children act whenever they disagree on something or whenever they get disciplined? This, this is what my kids would do whenever, whenever they were young. So I would go to my, my daughter and say, why did you just lock your brother in the closet? And her response would almost always be, he started it, <laughs> right? So, so what we're saying is you can't, um, Paul's saying don't make excuses again because you're young. You can't say I'm young. So, so that's what I do. And you can't say they started it, so it's their fault. You have to say, we're Christians, so we act like Christ. And, and this, is, this is where Paul's going to go with this. As um, there's these issues that creep into a church, that creep into the culture that we have to deal with. And, and we can respond in one of two ways, okay? One of two things we can do. We can respond in the right way, right? We do the right thing in the right way. Or you can do the right thing in the wrong way. I, I, I think there's a third option that we could put in. You could do the wrong thing in the wrong way, but I'm taking that one off the table. We're just gonna deal with right thing in the right way, right thing in the wrong way. You're like, okay, what does that mean? We'll get to that, but, but there are some people that, that will even tend to do the right thing in a way that is wrong or hurtful. And what did Paul tell us that we should do? Back to that first verse there. We should pursue righteousness, which is just obedience to God. We should pursue faith, which is trusting God, love and peace. I know, I know this can be hard, especially in our current culture and our current context, but, but it's essential that we try to navigate through controversial, heated issues in a way that ends in love and peace. Then, then he goes on and says this, along with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart, which means it's really important who you surround yourself with. You want those that have a pure heart for the Lord. It also implies this, right? That not everyone that calls on the name of the Lord does so out of a pure heart. You realize there are some people that claim to be Christians, Christ followers, that that really aren't, or at the very least, they don't act much like it. And then other people a controversial matter arises and they try to really do the right thing with pure and sincere motives. So, so sometimes, sometimes the response is really right and really good. Sometimes it's really damaging, which is what we wanna talk about. Then Paul says this, goes on in verse 23. He writes these words, don't have anything to do with watch, foolish 
and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels, right? And so, so I, here's what I think. I think there are a couple of issues that are going on here. There, there are a couple of ways that we can become involved in foolish arguments. One is this, one is we would fight and argue over things that are dumb and they just don't matter. And listen, Christians can be notorious for this, just chucking hand grenades and just um, dividing over things that don't matter. Some churches, right, some Christians have historically been known for that. Um, oftentimes uh, what we're known for best and just doing silly things. So, so like, uh, and I get these are theological issues, but maybe some of you came from this background. So like tongues, well, uh, do you believe in speaking in tongues? I believe it's really hard to speak without one, right? Like that's what I believe. <laughs> Listen, I get like if you're the theological neat nick, okay, fine. So, so there are examples in scripture of people speaking in tongues, foreign languages and angelic languages, usually to advance the gospel. And Paul gives guidelines for sure if you're gonna do it in a corporate setting of what it should look like. Within there, we just have a lot of freedom, right? Um, I don't know why we divide on that. Uh, how about the rapture? <laughs> rapture, like, like I'm for it, right? Like I don't know, it hasn't happened yet. If it does, I would like a ticket to ride. We, we don't have a lot of verses on that either. Those are just dumb things to fight and divide over. Or, or how about this one? Jesus return. We do not know when he is coming back, right? He makes it clear, only the Father knows that. But some people like to say they have it figured out, right? Because, because they have really big charts and graphs and they use big language and really weird arguments. Like, like you do realize that uh, there are verses in the Old Testament that talk about prophets that would make predictions that are false and not true about those guys getting stoned. Like, like if we would re-implement that, we would get rid of some Christian wingnuts today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but they'll say things like, we, we figured out when Jesus is coming back, we need to call a meeting, write a book, have a conference, start a blog so that we can tell people and everyone will be ready. Like, like Jesus is up in heaven going, would you look at that? They've got a chart. It says I'm coming back on January 21st. I did not want to come back on January. I was hoping for the spring. Um, that's winter. It's cold. I have a robe. I'll catch a draft. That's not convenient at all. But they got a chart, right? I mean, it looks official. I guess I'm Jack. That, that's when I've got to come back. Listen, we don't know. And those are goofy things to fight over and, and not salvation matters to d divide over. And we have to be really, as followers of Christ, if you are, you have to be really repentant and convicted that we don't quarrel over foolish stuff. So that's one way. The other thing we often do, um, the other way we tend to be quarrelsome is we think, I am a Christian, right? I read my Bible. I know what it says. Um, other people don't. I, I need to, it's my duty, right? Like to load the guns and to defend the name of God. And if someone disagrees with me, then I shoot them to the glory of God. And if they get upset and say mean things or harsh things back, well, then I just say things like, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Okay, well, well, where we fail and what we forget there is that there's more to an argument than just being right. Correct? So, so that's not the best way to present our case. Christians shouldn't just worry about defending our cause. We, should, we also have to worry about winning people to Jesus. So the nature, the nature of how we respond matters, which means this, that when we, we deal with people that don't know Jesus and, and don't love Jesus and don't have relationship with Jesus and they act like they don't know Jesus, love Jesus, or have relationship with Jesus, then we have to think about how to argue and stand for what is holy and what is true and what is right and what is good in a way that is loving and helpful to the person. So, so listen, it's not always about defending our case, which, which by the way, you do understand God is perfectly capable of defending himself. Like, like God's not up in heaven going, did you hear what she said about me? I, I, I don't even know where those words came from. Um, that really hurt my feelings, right? I am so upset right now. Angels, leave me alone. I, I, just, I need some me time. Um, he's, he's a big boy. And, and it's not always about defending our position. Sometimes it's about loving our enemy so they would come to know and love God too. And, and listen, um, sometimes people will, will respond and argue in, in hurtful or, or confusing ways. Um, poor ways, and, and then because, well, even if it's for the right cause, or even if it's for a good cause, and then because, 
because they're Christians, there becomes pressure on those of us who are Christ followers to really support or align with them because, listen, they, they are arguing for maybe a right thing or, or they are a brother or sister in Christ, but the way, listen, the way they argue uh, is wrong, and so it becomes confusing, and it becomes really messy. So, so what do we do, right? Paul's gonna go on. Tells us again, well, back in verse 23. Let's go back to what he said. He said, don't have anything to do with foolish Stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. So, so, so Paul's touching on the problem here, right? And that's when we respond like that, when, when we come back at people like that, it just leads to fighting and arguments. It's, it's like throwing a cat in a dog kennel, right? And it's just fur and claws flying everywhere. And, and here's the issue and here's the problem. Some of us like that, right? I mean, how many of you, if, if you're just being completely honest, and you don't have to raise your hand like, unless you want to, um, how many of you, though, you like to fight and you like to argue, right? That's just like your nature. You're combative like that. Uh, you, you've eaten too many cupcakes and nachos to like step into the ring to be an ultimate fighter, right? You're not gonna get into a cage match or do hand-to-hand, but verbally and, and mentally and in a debate, you've got the gloves on and you can take a brother out, right? So you're like, I know versus, I have got a quick wit, I will, I will beat that guy, right? Um, she will not make it through to the next round. So some of you, this is what you do, right? I like to win. I love to win arguments. But, but now watch what Paul says next. This is awful if that is you. Verse 24, he tells us, and the Lord's servant. So if, if you're a follower of Christ, if, if you're not a follower of Christ, you can ignore this. But if you are, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone. You're like, oh no, come on. Like, like how many of you, um, you read that if you're like me and you think, that's not the direction I would have gone with that, right? Like that is not what I would have written because you think I can win and I need to defend our cause. And I would say, n- n- not always, right? Um, so, so you can't be quarrelsome. So maybe you're the person in the room going, okay, well then what do we do? Because it is a controversial matter or it is a controversial issue. They said something bad. They said something mean. They said something that goes against our values. Somebody's wrong. Oh, okay. I agree. But you still can't respond in hurtful uh, ways or foolish ways because it just leads to more quarreling. So you say, okay, what do we do? Do we just say, throw our hands in the air and say, it's just the culture we live in. Uh, We don't want to offend anyone. We just affirm all beliefs, backgrounds, religions, lifestyles, just whatever. Okay, what did did Paul tell us? He said, and and this is how we respond that changes everything. But be kind to who? (laughs) Everyone. (laughs) Oh, really? Like, here's what I would say. That right there is one of the greatest lines of evidence or proof that your Bible is inspired by God, right? Because it tells us to do things that we do not want to do, right? It's not just randomly made up. Be kind to everyone. But like if it were up to you and I, if it were up to us, we would say something like, be kind to everyone who is just like me, right? They're smart and funny and attractive and say all the right things. In fact, if we could clone an entire nation of people just like me, that would be awesome, right? I mean, you wouldn't say that, but, but if we're honest, sometimes that's what we think and that's what we imagine. Um, but he just said, do not be quarrelsome, right? And, and Paul says, uh, we're to be kind to, to who? Everyone. You're like, ah, um, even those people, right? Do I have to be nice to those people, right? Like even them? Are you quarreling right now? <laughs> right? It's really tricky. So, so do I have to be nice to them? Yes. Well, how about my enemies? Yep. Okay. How about my ex-boyfriend? Because he is a loser. <laughs> yes. Well, how about my fiance's ex? Yes. She's the devil in a dress. I know. You still have to be nice. Okay. Well, how about people that believe the wrong things and they're, and they're really obnoxious and they attack us and they make me so mad? Yes. Can't, can't we just attack them back and shut them up? <laughs> no. Like, I don't have any verses for that. So, so we have to love them and we have to be nice to them. And you're like, I, I don't want to. I, I know. You think you can win. Maybe. And I would say this, it's not that you can't be passionate and have zeal for the glory of God. And it's not that you can't take a firm stance on things that scripture clearly takes a stance and speaks to. In fact, uh, inside the church, 
with religious people, Jesus and Paul were often offensive and they were very, very direct. But I would say in a culture that in large part does not know Christ, we just can't be harsh and condescending with a my way or the highway, take it or leave it, stick it to them attitude because a lot of people walk away from Jesus and the potential of having lives changed because of the attitudes of Christians. So, so what should we do? Paul says, goes on in verse 24, tells us, you should be able to teach, okay, um, which one would indicate you're spending some time getting to know the word of God, getting around people that are wise so you're thinking God's thoughts. But, but I, also, I also wanna point this out. Being able to teach isn't just knowing a lot of verses and being able to prove and present your case. Because if that's all that you think that teaching is, well then once again, you will load the guns and as soon as an issue gets heated, you'll have an emotional reaction, you'll get all fired up and you'll go on a witch hunt to try and prove your case. So, so you understand teaching's not just about having the right cause and the right facts or right um, facts. It's also about having the right attitude. Why? Because there are a lot of people that are deceived and, and they don't know Jesus and they don't know what his word says and, and they are confused about a lot of things. They have partial truths or they've only heard certain things or, or maybe they're just in a, in a really dark and, and difficult season where they've just been hurt and they're just lashing out at whatever. And, and by being quarrelsome and being self-righteous, they're not gonna learn, right? They're just gonna become defensive, are you right back? And, and it becomes a very personal debate. And they'll walk away still not knowing Jesus or the hope that he has or, or the good news that he offers or why they should even care. So first you have to be able to teach Kindly, right? Kindly. And then he says this, not resentful. Um, that could also be translated this way, patiently enduring evil. This is what we are called to. You can't get resentful. You have to patiently endure evil. Here's why. Here's why. You will do this. If you're trying to be faithful to Christ's mission, you will love people and you will be kind and you will be thoughtful and maybe even disagree in ways that are respectful and that are gracious. And they will say, you're an idiot and your position is lame, dated, stupid, and that you're a closed-minded, narrow-minded moron, okay? You may get that. And listen, at that point, at that point, you can't become resentful. So, so maybe you have some, some friends coworkers, neighbors, people you see at the gym or at the store or in class, uh, family members that you will talk to and tell about Christ. And, and maybe they dismiss you or they just flat out ridicule you. Okay, let me say, at that point, you can't become resentful because then you've made it personal. You have to understand, if you, if you love someone, if you pursue them, reach out to them, serve them, you know, try to act like Christ, and, and they mock you, it's, it's not God, or I'm sorry, it's not you they've rejected, it's God they've rejected. And, and again, he's a big boy, he can totally handle himself. He's probably already got some other way he's going to try and pursue them. So, so for us, you, you can't make it personal or you become bitter and you become resentful and you'll start to sever relationships with people that are not Christian or who don't agree with you. Because again, here's what I know. Most of us tend to like people that are like us, which means the things that we really like about others, the characteristics and traits we like about them are things that remind us of ourselves. So for the most part, we don't even really like them. We just like ourselves and what we see in them. <laughs> so... Don't do that or, or you remove yourselves from people that need Christ the most. And, and just know, just be aware going in, if, if you have an opinion and stand for anything, especially anything that matters, someone's going to oppose you. Just, just recognize that and be aware of it and be ready. So then Paul goes on and says this in verse 25. Opponents, so that's just assuming we're gonna have opponents. Opponents must be Gently instructed, right? Highlight gently there. So how many of you, maybe you like to instruct, you like to tell people what to do, right? You're like, oh, I can totally instruct. What would you like for me to tell you? Okay, with gentleness. You're like, what does that even mean? We strive for gentleness. So through love and patience and kindness and mercy to engage. And then he says this, goes on in 25. And here, here's where we're trying to get. In the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. 
So, so question, okay? We, we've talked a bit about what Paul's written. Um, do you want people to come to know Christ, right? To love Jesus, because I do, right? That is what I want more than anything. I want people to love and have relationship with Christ. That is our goal, that they would stop sinning, stop making hurtful choices, stop shipwrecking the marriage or the family or their health or their job or their joy and come to know Christ. That is what we're all about. And so, so you can't become bitter and you can't become resentful and turn your back on the very people that need God the most. And, and even in our zeal to champion morality or the name of Christ, that we would get in the way of people coming to him that actually most need him, where, where they would reject Christ or God because they're going, if, if you're team Jesus, then I don't want anything to do with him because you're mean and, and you take things personally and, and you're not very gracious. So right, God, God loves those people. God loves all people. And, and we, here's what we want. We want people, I don't care how harsh or where that, what they believe, we want them to realize their need for Jesus. Like, like do, you, do you know why people do wrong things, make bad choices? Do you know why they sin? Because listen, they are deceived. Right? Like this is what I want you to see. If you've got nothing else this morning, here's what I want you to see. And here's why I challenge you to think about how you respond and how you are you and how you defend the faith. This is why Paul is challenging Timothy not to be quarrelsome. And I want you to watch this last verse we're gonna look at because for me, this was a game changer when I understood this. Here's what Paul writes in verse 26. So, so in the hope they would come to a knowledge of truth and then this. They will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them, check out this word and, and highlight this in your Bible, taken them captive to do his will. This is, this is so incredibly important. I, I, man, I really hope this sinks in for you today. So, so this is the spiritual reality. We have an enemy, right? You and I, we actually have this literal spiritual enemy and his name is Satan, right? He's this angel that declared war on God. He's the great deceiver that convinced a third of the angels to turn their back on the God that created them and join his team. And then he gets kicked out of heaven, comes down to earth, and now he is up to something that is absolutely awful. And that is, he's taken people captive. Which have you ever considered that? Like, have you ever thought about it that way? Because I'll tell you, I, I didn't realize that and I didn't understand that for, for such a long time, right? And, and when I saw that and the lights came on, it was again, it was life changing. Because I just thought people were doing wrong things and dishonoring God and I have to go and protect his honor and push back and, and point that stuff and, and show them or help them stop what they're doing that's wrong. But, but Paul just said what? The enemy has, he has taken captives, which would suggest that people that are in sin and living ungodly lifestyles and, and making bad, hurtful, foolish choices, those people have been taken captive by the enemy. So, so here's what I want us to do. I want us to take this imagery that Paul gives right here, right, that he writes here in 2 Timothy 2, take this imagery and consider what it means. Because you and I, we would say, right? I, I think you would agree. We would say captives should be treated with dignity and compassion, right? We should treat captives well. So, so meaning if, if a citizen, right? If some citizen gets taken captive, captured in war or, or by some terrorists, they get abducted into sex trafficking or, you know, get held up in some hostage situation and they send soldiers or SWAT or some special forces in to liberate those people that have been taken captive, but then they go in. We wouldn't like it if they just showed up and all of a sudden they just start shooting and taking out everyone. Cause we'd be like, whoa, wait a second. Those those are captives, right? You help them, you free them, you save them from their captivity, you don't attack them. Okay, well then, in the same way, I, I want you to understand and realize Satan has taken people captive. And here's what he wants. He wants you and I to come in and just start unloading on everyone, right? To, to attack, to maybe respond in a way that would alienate them even further. Because again, we do have a, an enemy 
And, and we are, we are for sure in a battle. It's just, it's just not with people that disagree or look different or act different than us. It is with Satan, right? He's the enemy and he has set a trap and he deceives people to come and do his will. And so they are captive thinking that what they're doing is right thinking there's nothing wrong with the choices or the lifestyle or the behavior that they're living in, and then even becoming hateful towards those who disagree. Because again, the trap has been set, they've stepped right into it, and now they are being deceived. And as believers, listen, as believers, you can't look at those people and go, that's the enemy, right? I need to stop them, shut them down. I need to go and reclaim our territory. You have to go, whoa, wait a moment. That's a captive. They're deceived, they're confused. We don't need to declare war on them. Uh, we need to bring them out of captivity, right? They need to be saved. They need to be set free from the trap that they are in. So they don't need to be alienated. They don't need to be responded to harshly. They don't need to be defeated. What they need is Christ, that through love, and patience and gentleness and kindness and ability to teach and not becoming resentful, our response, their response would be, what was I thinking? Right, like, like thank you for loving me in such a way that I could be set free from the trap of the enemy. C could you maybe tell me more about Jesus? That, that is how our response helps change everything. And again, in a culture where there's so much, it's so toxic and it's so volatile and so divisive, our response becomes a game changer and it starts with you. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray for us now. Listen, if, if you're in the room and, and maybe you've been hurt by some, some Christians that responded in ways that didn't honor God and what he called for, I want you to know he loves you and he wants you to come to a place of repentance and he wants you to be set free. And you could do that today. And, and for the rest of us that wear the name of Christ, we want to practice this. We want to be sent out on a rescue mission to set captives free. So let me pray and we'll wrap up here. Heavenly Father, we do pray um, that we would have patience, that we would endure evil, that we would have a heart of kindness and, and love and peace, that we would um, be these first responders when it comes to kingdom stuff and understand the nature of the game, which doesn't mean we don't stand firmly for what is right, but we look at people different. So I pray you would change our hearts. I pray for the person in here that needs a relationship with you, that has never made that step, that today they may would make that step for the first time and help us to continue to fight to be agents of change. God, we love you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.